Hello and welcome to the Rejuvenation Roundup podcast, where we explore the latest in life extension and anti-aging science with a dive into a month's worth of insights and new breakthroughs. This podcast is a combined effort of the Lifespan Extension Advocacy Foundation, which operates Lifespan.io and Future Grind, a podcast that explores the ethics and impact of emerging science and technology. Spooky season is upon us once again, and this episode will feature some talk of zombies. I know you can't wait, so let's get into it. Starting off with our research roundup. Researchers have found that intramuscular injections of plasma concentrate made from human umbilical cord blood improve various health biomarkers and decrease biological age in elderly people. In recent years, researchers including Michael and Irina Conboy have experimented with blood and plasma exchange in the context of longevity. Their continuing research has shown that heterochronic parabiosis, as well as plasma transfusion and dilution, alleviate various aspects of aging and can decrease biological age as measured by methylation clocks. In this new study, 18 participants with a mean age of 74 were given a weekly intramuscular injection of umbilical cord plasma concentrate for 10 weeks, meaning that every participant received an equivalent of one liter of plasma over the course of the study. As the researchers note, umbilical cord plasma treatment can potentially recapitulate some of the benefits of stem cell therapy without actually transplanting living cells, and one study showed that human umbilical cord plasma rejuvenates the hippocampus in mice. The researchers looked for changes in biological age using several well-established methylation clocks. Grim age, which is known as one of the best clocks, showed a significant reduction of biological age, 0.82 years on average. Additionally, markers of kidney function such as creatinine and glomerular filtration rate were greatly improved. While this is promising, more robust clinical trials are needed to determine the extent of the benefits that plasma concentrate injections confer. Next up, rapamycin is capable of extending the lifespan of several organisms and is thus believed to be one of the most promising anti-aging drugs. However, it was previously shown that chronic rapamycin treatment can have a detrimental effect. In a new study, researchers sought to explore if a brief treatment of rapamycin would attenuate age-related decline in two model organisms without the unwanted toxicity. In the first set of experiments, the researchers treated female fruit flies with rapamycin at different ages. They show that 30-day treatment in early adulthood, but not later, extends the lifespan of flies as much as lifelong exposure. Flies treated in only the first 15 days of their adult lives enjoyed similarly extended lifespans. In addition to the increased lifespan, these flies demonstrated preserved intestinal function. The researchers also confirmed that the beneficial effect of short rapamycin treatment early in life was achieved via the inhibition of TORC1 and prolonged upregulated autophagy. They showed that blocking the increase of rapamycin-induced autophagy canceled out both the lifespan extension and the improved intestinal health of treated flies. In the next set of experiments, the researchers compared chronic and short-term rapamycin treatment in female mice. Both groups of mice were exposed to rapamycin starting from the age of three months, but the second group was only treated for three months. The tissues of all the mice were collected at the age of 12 months and evaluated. Gut integrity was preserved in short-term treated mice on par with the chronically treated mice. It's also worth noting that treating 15-month-old mice with rapamycin for three months resulted in improved regenerative capacity of the intestine, suggesting a beneficial effect of the drug even when taken later in life. This enlightening study demonstrates that short-term rapamycin treatment in early adulthood has the same beneficial long-lasting effects as chronic rapamycin exposure without the adverse effects that the latter might bring. There are still many questions regarding the effect of various rapamycin regimens in animals, let alone in humans. Nevertheless, time and time again rapamycin shows beneficial effects conserved across species. While many anti-diabetes drugs have been developed in recent decades, with some even showing potential as anti-aging drugs, there is a growing understanding that type 2 diabetes can be prevented and even reversed with the help of a healthy diet. However, there is an ongoing battle between diets, such as the ketogenic diet and the Mediterranean diet. Now in a new study, researchers directly pitted those two diets against each other in people with prediabetes and type 2 diabetes. The study consisted of two groups of people with a median age of 60 and a median BMI of 30. Both groups started with one diet, 
either the ketogenic or the Mediterranean, and switch to the other diet after 12 weeks. The researchers tried to make the two diets as healthy as possible. They used a well-formulated ketogenic diet and encouraged the participants on the Mediterranean diet to enhance it by completely avoiding refined sugars and grains. Both diets incorporate three key nutrition principles endorsed by diabetes organizations worldwide, including non-starchy vegetables, restricting added sugars, and limiting refined grains. The main differences between the two involve legumes, fruits, and whole grains, which are avoided in the ketogenic diet but are welcome in the Mediterranean diet. During the keto phase, participants had to sustain ketosis by limiting carbohydrates to 20 to 50 grams per day and keeping protein consumption at about 5 grams per 1 kilogram of body weight per day, with all other calories coming from fats. During the Mediterranean phase, participants followed a mostly plant-based diet consisting of vegetables, fruits, whole grains, nuts, and seeds, with fish as the primary source of animal protein and olive oil as the primary source of fat. In both phases, participants were advised against consuming any processed foods and were allowed to eat without limiting calories. Participants on both diets lost weight, and weight loss was stronger with a ketogenic diet. Both diets led to similar decreases in glycated hemoglobin levels, even though participants on the ketogenic diet had been consuming 50% fewer carbohydrates compared to participants on the Mediterranean. However, the ketogenic diet led to a more significant decrease in triglyceride levels. The ketogenic diet also resulted in a substantial increase in LDL cholesterol, which the researchers interpreted as a health risk. Keto led to greater decreases in essential nutrients than the Mediterranean diet, including in fiber, folate, vitamin C, and magnesium, which the researchers attribute to the exclusion of foods such as fruits and whole grains. There were no substantial differences in adherence to and in satisfaction from both diets during the study. Interestingly, participants tended to give higher marks to whatever diet they had started with. The results of this comparative study are generally in line with previous research. Both diets produced considerable metabolic benefits for people with prediabetes and type 2 diabetes. However, there were obvious trade-offs. The ketogenic diet was more effective in decreasing weight and triglyceride levels, but it also raised LDL cholesterol and restricted essential nutrients such as fiber. That's it for our research roundup. You can find more on these and other stories on our website at lifespan.io forward slash roundup. In September, a new video from LifeNoggin, created in partnership with the SENS Research Foundation, broke down the concept of senescent cells so that everyone can understand what they are and what we can do about them. To do this, they used the metaphor of zombie cells. Here's what that sounded like. Thank you so much to the SENS Research Foundation for sponsoring this video. Oh, hey, you caught me watching my favorite zombie show, The Blocking Dead. It's on its 75th season and I truly have no idea what's happening anymore. But this show has reminded me of a fun video idea. Did you know that an entire army of zombies is living inside you? And it's getting larger every day. Yeah, buckle up, cue the intro. Hey there, welcome to Life Noggin. It's true, there's a horde of zombies living inside of you. Zombie cells, that is. The cells in your body are continually dividing and replacing old or damaged tissue and repairing wounds. This is what keeps you healthy. But eventually, due to cellular stress, they stop multiplying. And instead of being killed through a process known as apoptosis or cleared from the body by the immune system, they remain and release harmful substances called SASP. SASP stands for Senescence Associated Secretory Phenotype, and they can destroy or impair the cells around them. The cells that release SASP or just won't go away are called senescent cells or zombie cells. And as you age, you get more and more of them, leading to age-related disorders like cancer, cardiovascular disease, dementia, osteoporosis, and metabolic diseases. The development of these cells is considered a hallmark of aging, but scientists are finding ways to slow down their buildup or even remove them in order to prevent or treat age-related disease and ultimately extend one's lifespan. There are three main methods being explored, and they're all fascinating. The first and most popular 
are senolytics. These are drugs that target and kill senescent cells by inducing apoptosis. There are many senolytics being tested in animals and some even in clinical trials with varying success, as well as targeted delivery strategies to mitigate serious side effects like tissue dysfunction. Another strategy is SASP inhibitors or cinemorphics. These drugs can stop the zombie cells from secreting SASP so it can prevent it from damaging nearby cells, or even worse, by creating more zombie cells. The last method is boosting our immunosurveillance by strengthening the immune system so it can recognize and eliminate senescent cells by itself. All three approaches have pros and cons, but they follow a broader theory of how to stop aging by stopping the buildup of senescent cells. This is called the damage repair approach. Preventing damage would require messing with a complicated and delicate system, but waiting for the disease to occur may be too late. Treating the body as the damage accumulates, however, that could work. And not just with these zombie senescent cells, but all types of age-related damage. Which is exactly what our sponsor, the SENS Research Foundation, is working on with Apoptosens and other programs. Check out their links in the description to learn more about the amazing work that they are doing. Other new episodes of Life Noggin explore the effects of lead poisoning, the problem of kidney stones, and what happens to your brain when you go to sleep all high. Find those and more on the Life Noggin YouTube channel. Meanwhile, Lifespan News has released new episodes exploring studies that show that multivitamins may improve human cognition and that certain longevity molecules may preserve hair and hearing in mice. Ryan also released a new video on jellyfish dow, which is taking a fresh approach to longevity advocacy. Here's a bit of that video. What if we could go on, hold the light a little longer? What if your parents could grow healthier and stay? What if all the knowledge and potential you'd gained over your life wasn't simply lost? That was the beginning of the mission video for the newly launched Jellyfish DAO a decentralized autonomous organization focused on accelerating the development of health span and lifespan extending technologies. There are numerous DAOs already working in the longevity and healthcare space, doing some very interesting work, including Vita DAO, Cure DAO, Longevity DAO, Athena DAO, and more. But Jellyfish is taking a very different approach. They are seeking to fund longevity-focused media, including nonfiction and fiction films and videos, podcasts, games, and more. To tell you why, here are clips from their video featuring Lifespan.io's Tim Maupin and Keith Comito, who are also core members of the Jellyfish team. The problem we're tackling at Jellyfish now is how to get the public to be more on board with longevity at large and how to communicate these ideas in a positive light. Our mission is to tell stories and use the power of cinema to get people to rethink aging and many of the associated negative concerns with longevity, to which cinema and story are uniquely positioned to do. Greater public acceptance would move the science faster and ultimately more quickly reduce suffering and save more lives. One of the non-obvious things that I think actually holds back the pace of research is not seeing the value of public engagement initiatives and how that has a force multiplying effect. So even if all you cared about was just dollars going into research, I think funding media projects that get the public excited, informed, and engaged on this topic is a huge force multiplier. And that's one of the reasons why I'm choosing to spend some of my time working with Jellyfish Down. In addition to spreading the message of longevity through impactful media, members of the Jellyfish community could actually be able to influence the production of these works, taking a sort of producer role to help make decisions and even be featured in the content. Not only that, but they are discussing exciting opportunities with exclusive and original NFTs, possibly even linked to and impacted by the very same breakthrough work they go to fund. So who is this community for? Madalena Ion explains more. We're bringing together a community of longevity advocates, filmmakers, entrepreneurs, and wall breakers. I'm uh, in the film industry for almost a decade. I don't have a favorite longevity movie yet because we are about to make one. There are three initial feature films currently slated for Jellyfish support. They include a full-length adaptation of Tim Maupin's award-winning short film The Last Generation to Die, Galia Barcole's documentary Ageless, and the film Madalena just referenced there called Genethic. So how does this all work? 
Well, the good news is that's still being decided, and they are actively looking to grow the community. So you have an opportunity to get in early and make a real difference here. If this sounds at all interesting to you, please visit the Jellyfish DAO website at jellyfish.foundation. Once there, you can join the team, including me, on Discord. Big things are happening, and we want you to be involved. Please share this video to let others know about it as well, and help us support longevity for all. I'm Ryan O'Shea, and we'll see you next time on Lifespan News. You can find more on the Lifespan News YouTube channel. Before we close this episode, we wanted to take a look back at Longevity Summit Dublin, which took place in September and served as a gathering place for longevity researchers, investors, and advocates. There they discussed collaborations and worked to forge a common vision, a conversation that was largely led by Lifespan.io Executive Director Stephanie Dano. Stephanie received the Rising Star Award at the conference and spoke about the ways in which Lifespan.io works to connect various players in the field to promote the common goal of extending healthy human lifespan. We look forward to more of these events and more collaborations with partners and peers. If you're interested in attending a longevity-focused event, Transvision Madrid will be taking place in Spain on November 12th and 13th. Visit transvisionmadrid.com to learn more. That's it for this episode of the Rejuvenation Roundup podcast. Thank you very much for spending another month with us and for your help in the fight against age-related diseases. Whether you're donating, spreading the word, or simply listening to our content, we appreciate your help. Remember to subscribe, leave a review, and post about us on social media. This will increase our reach and introduce more people to the importance of life extension science. Don't forget you can get additional deep dives into science, technology, and futurism on the Future Grind podcast. Find out more at futuregrind.org. Thank you for joining us, and we hope to see you next time on the Rejuvenation Roundup podcast. Mm -hmm.